This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here. Go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. It's no different than being a professional baseball player. You can't be a one-trick pony. You have to be a five-tool player in order to succeed in this game. This is the Power Producers Podcast. Production redefined. Are you ready to feel the power? Listen, there's a reason why you're the first person on my podcast, okay? And for everybody that's out there listening, this is Mr. Bernie Borges. I call him the godfather of social media marketing, whether or not that's accurate uh, internationally, it certainly is in my world. He wrote the book Marketing 2.0 um, a little bit over 10 years ago. I bought a copy of it. I read it. I read it again. I read it a third time and immediately used it as an instruction manual for how I was going to market my business at a time where not very many people understood social media marketing, and more importantly, weren't willing to try and understand social media marketing. And if there's one thing that I took out of that whole experience and have have continued to replicate over the last 10 years of my life, it's been when you see an opportunity that nobody else is doing, seize it and run with it. And I use this when I talk to agencies all over the country When the industry goes left, I'm running right because I know that's where the real opportunity is. I never want to be a lemming. Well said, David. Well said. So listen, there's been a lot that's been, you know, going on. And one of the things that we ask everybody when they come on the show is what's the daily routine look like? Every successful person that I've talked to has a daily routine. And I know what it used to be, but I want to see if 10 years later, it's still the same. What, what does your day start like? It is still the same. If I told you exactly what it was 10 years ago, because I have been doing this for a few decades. So, uh, alarm goes off at 4 45 AM. And, uh, first thing I do is, um, get a cup of coffee and then I sit down with the Bible and I read the Bible for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then I take another 10 or 15 minutes of just quiet prayer and meditation, lifting up people that, uh, you know, are close to me. And then of course, at this moment in time, as we're recording this, you know, we're all dealing with the coronavirus. So doing a lot of praying about that. Uh, And then after that, I go to the gym. So I start, you know, feeding my spirit first and then go to the gym and, and uh, work on my body. And the, the combination of those two really get my day going It's something to me, it's sustenance. Honestly, it is sustenance. I need that time, both, both elements uh, in order for me to really get ready for the day. And I've been doing that for decades. You know, it's funny because I have always believed that I perform the best if mind, body, and spirit are all three being exercised on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's extremely important that I'm continuously doing whatever I need to do to sharpen the saw and become better at my craft, be, um, you know, just the best insurance guy that I can be, be the best dad that I can be with four kids. There's plenty for me to learn in that vernacular as well. Um, You know, and then from the, the spiritual aspect of it, we talked about it with the with Brian Lovell when we were recording with him, but every day starts with uh, leadership promises for every day from John Maxwell. It's a, it's a good way for me to get some leadership and some biblical principles in. And then 
Most recently, it's become Orange Theory, although that's at a uh, standstill for the time being right, right. Due, sure. due to the coronavirus. But, uh, you know, I really feel like I get the most accomplished in life when I have those three things in balance. And that may be like a little bit of a Zen type thought process, but I do think it's applicable. And I can trace back all of the times that I've been the most successful over my career to the times when I was in the best physical shape, the best fit, uh, mental shape and the best spiritual shape that I've been in. Totally agree. Totally agree. It's the trifecta of what we need to do in life to, um, to succeed and just live a fulfilling life. Absolutely. David, you talked about the book you're reading, um, the Maxwell book that you're reading. Bernie, what's something that you're reading or listening to right now that you think everybody should listen to or, or read themselves? So I actually, um, I haven't been reading books for a few years now because I've gotten into the habit of audio books. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening to audio books and I'm also reading uh, or listening to a lot of podcasts and my taste is all over the board. I recently completed my first novel in years. I read the will to die by Joe Polizzi. Um, he's someone who's written five, I think five, um, marketing books and so he authored his first novel and it was terrific. So I listened to that. Uh, and then other books I've read recently include, um, drawing a blank on, on the name, oh, um, ne um, never split the difference by, uh, Chris Foss. He's a famous former FBI negotiator who is now out there on the circuit and he's an author and, you know, he's everywhere. He's, you know, on, on TV. Sounds interesting. What's that? I said, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Again, someone who literally negotiated with terrorists right. and then has basically taken those principles and brought them to the world. And, and as he says, whether you're negotiating with your kids to get them to go to bed or oh. you're negotiating <laughs> your salary or you're negotiating a contract, the principles apply. You know, it's interesting, man, because I, my dad had a few sayings growing up besides shut up and go to your room that stick with <laughs> me. And one of them was you never, in a negotiation, you never name your price first, because if you do, you're always negotiating against yourself in that process. And it's funny because with the way technology has worked today, and, you know, even just the travels that we've been fortunate enough to do, going on cruises to different ports, visiting different countries and go into the flea markets and stuff like that, where negotiating is basically a requirement. It's it, it's a way of life for a lot of foreign countries. But I do a lot of stuff where I outsource artwork and things like that for graphics design on Fiverr. And every time I want a custom offer, it's like I'm literally getting into a virtual wrestling match with whoever the designer is trying to get them to name their price first. And I refuse to do it. And so it blows my mind because unequivocally, every single time that I have held out and made them name their price first, it's half of what I was going to offer them. So there's some wisdom in that. And I think that there's a lot that we can learn as a society as a whole about negotiating and it's something that I really I'm, I'm going to probably pick up a copy of that book and read it because that's right up my alley and I have not heard of it, nor have I read it yet. You'll enjoy it. You'll enjoy it. So, listen, it's been a decade, man, and we're going to camp out here for a little bit because there's a lot of meat to this topic. But you wrote the book Marketing 2.0. I want to say it was either 08 or 09. I don't remember. for It was sure. 09. I, I do remember that you told me that if I ever thought about a, writing a book, don't and I <laughs> and and I broke that rule. I actually have a book coming out May first. That's awesome. Uh, called the Extra Two Minutes, and it it goes to my theory that the difference between good salespeople and best in class salespeople is literally taking two extra minutes to do something to a level that your competition isn't willing to do it. Whether it's writing an email, whether it's um, you know explaining something. I see so many times that people are out on the streets. I mean, I see it all the time in our industry where you go to request information from a gatekeeper and they write back and say, I'm sorry, you know, I'm not going to provide that information to you. And when I look at the email that the salesperson sent, they basically did nothing but ask for the information. When I ask for the information, I say, here's what I need. Here's why I need it. 
here's how it's going to benefit you. And this is what I'm going to do with it to give you the results of our analysis coming back. And I get the information every time. The difference is it took me two more minutes (laughs) to write that email, but I, I literally get it every single time. So I'm interested, you know, obviously I've said time and time again, and people have heard all kinds of stories. I mean, it was probably 10 years ago that you had me on your podcast and it was right after we had gotten a big workers comp account due to a blog post that was written on the workers compensation experience modifier. And it still shows up every year in my Facebook memories. And I go back and I try and listen to it every year if I can remember in my Facebook memories. But what's interesting to me, and I'm gonna, I'm really going to be I'm listening to what your answer to this is. I really don't think that the principles of Marketing 2.0 have changed. I would argue that the platforms have changed. So David, you nailed it. And um, that's actually something that I was very intentional when I wrote the book. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm looking through my table of contents right now on Marketing 2.0, which published in 2009. And the subtitle of the book is Bridging the Gap Between Seller and Buyer Through Social Media Marketing. And you'll notice that I, I point out, I use the word seller, right? Because the seller is the company or an individual who's trying to reach the buyer, right? So I'm using the word seller and buyer in the subtitle. And as I look at the table of contents, and, and I say things like, you know, so first of all, what is the web? What is social media? Uh, what are some of the drivers for social media? Uh, fostering community and conversations is a chapter. Developing a strategy is a chapter. We still need a strategy today. Think like a publisher through content marketing. Boy, that couldn't be any, any bigger today than it, that, well, it is a whole lot bigger, but I mean, it couldn't be any more true. Personal branding which um, uh, Tom Peters wrote an article in 1997 published in Fast Company on personal branding. 1997. That was before, I mean, the internet existed, but it certainly was anything but mainstream. It was, it was infancy. Um, let's see, measuring results in social media marketing, um, the benefits of social media marketing. So to your point, yes, the, the principles absolutely still apply. The principles are still grounded in the first word of the phrase social media, which is social, being social. And too many people overlook that. Too many people think of social media as they did even in 2009 when the book published, but even today, too many think of it as a broadcasting platform. And so really what still is in place today is the need to treat social media as a communication and interaction channel. And it's a series of channels because you have different platforms. You mentioned your Facebook feed. I haven't looked at Facebook in two years, but I'm active on other platforms, even though I I walked away from Facebook. So it's all about what are the channels you're going to engage in? How are you going to engage? How are you going to connect with people and and and, and make friends, if you will, if you want to use the, the, the term friends? How are you going to build relationships? But going into it with a strategy, what's your goal? What do you want to accomplish? So all the things that, that were in the book, platforms aside, and I, and I knew that the platforms were going to evolve in 2009. Of course, I had no way of predicting what was coming, but I knew they were going to evolve. So I tried to focus on the strategy around the practices and only make a, you know, a little bit of mention of some of the platforms that existed then like Twitter, like Facebook, like YouTube, which has evolved even more into being social. So absolutely back to your main point that the principles, the practices are, are just as applicable today as they were when the book published in 2009. So if you really want to have your mind blown And it's interesting because I typically read stuff as it comes out or as it's trendy. But for whatever reason, I did not read Permission-Based Marketing by Seth Godin until about two or three years ago. And I don't know if you've read his book or not, but this guy back in the late 90s essentially laid out a roadmap for exactly what Amazon was going to be today. I mean, I was sitting here thinking to myself as I read that book, 
this is nuts. This is almost like Back to the Future too. When he when when Biff had the almanac, this guy basically called every single shot that Amazon was going to make two decades later. Insane. But I think that isn't that true? Really, with business as a whole. I mean, if I really boil down what I do for a living right now, the principles of what I do are exactly the same as what they were a hundred years ago. I just have a different platform in which I operate. Yeah. At the end of the day, a product is something that meets a need and whether it's a known need or it's not a known need. My favorite example of not a known need is nobody, nobody anywhere. There was no research that told Steve Jobs that the world needs an iPhone. There was not a need for that. That was that was product innovation. But at the end of the day, he created a product that there was a need for once the, the world became aware of what it was. But when it comes to things like insurance, you know, a, a gallon of milk, a haircut, uh, you know, car, you know, car maintenance, those are known needs. So at the end of the day, we just have to be able to really good at communicate communicating our ability to fill a need with our product or service. And we have to do it in a way that is more human than, than has been in, in the past, meaning we have to communicate to people and make sure that our messaging is resonating with people at some emotional level. I heard a phrase, I'll, I'll attribute it to, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on, on his name at the moment, um, the CEO of, of Nimble, my friend, John Ferrara. Sorry, John, if you hear this. <laughs> I just had one of those you know, momentary lapses. And, and he always said, and I love this saying, again, from John, everybody is out to buy a better version of themselves. Whatever you're buying, it's a better version of yourself. Even if it's grocery shopping, you're still, it's just, at, you know, even at a deeper level, you're buying a better version of yourself. So if you think in terms of meeting an emotional need, and then messaging and communicating and engaging with your prospective buyers that way, then you're off to a good start. Yeah. I, one of my good friends, Jason Cass, is a thought leader in the insurance industry. His podcast is Agency Intelligence and um, Agents Influence. And Cass is definitely somebody who is on the front line of thought processes for taking our industry to the next level. And he uses the iPhone. It's funny to me that you use that because he uses the iPhone as the example all the time. It's not, and I'm trying to remember exactly what he says, but it's not about innovation. It's about transformation. Innovation, and I might, I might not, sorry, Jason, but I might not be using your right words, but I'm going to get the thought process right because I agree with it wholeheartedly. We started out with, records. Then we went to cassettes. Then we went to eight tracks. Those are all innovations that took a product to a different level. Then we went to compact discs. The transformation happened when music became digital and you could access it from your phone. The transformation happened when you no longer have to have a phone, a Walkman, a camera. It's all built into one device in your pocket that you can readily use. And, you know, one of the things that we talk about for people that are really in touch with what's going on in the insurance industry, in the middle market, you know, the accounts where Kyle and I live, the, the $250,000 to $500,000 in premium, it would be very, very difficult to replace the agent. You're always going to have to have a technician on an account that size. Artificial intelligence might be a tool you can use but it's not a replacement. As you move downstream, insurance becomes more and more commoditized. The relationship and the need for expert advice goes away and you're not competing against other agencies anymore. We're not that far away. Mark my words, this might be my Seth Godin moment, but we're not that far away from somebody going in, placing an order on Amazon and having a button that says, by the way, while you were shopping, we've created a homeowner's insurance quote for you. Click here to see what that would be. And they're going to do it. They have big data has everything they need to do to extinguish the small main street shops, both on the commercial side for cookie cutter business, as well as personal lines. And certainly they've already started doing it in life insurance. 
So I think that, you know, for, for salespeople that are out there, whether it's insurance or anything else, you got to transform in order to really stay ahead of the curve. Because if you don't, you're not going to be around. You're going to be extinct. And my, my tagline's kill or be killed. That's the way it is on the streets. So what I would add to that is I, I agree. And I've been like you, I've been following AI and I, and I think that there are elements of AI that are very much in place today that are very productive. Things like uh, sales teams can record their call using platforms like Chorus and Gong and then get get uh, analytics and suggestions on how to improve those calls. And that's just one of many examples. So there's lots of ways AI is already in use today and very productive. In terms of long-term displace, displacement potential, sure, yeah. Timeline, not sure. You know, I don't have my crystal ball on that. So I'd rather focus on the today. And today, salespeople still need to be very good at creating relationships. Now, I'm talking B2B. I'm not talking retail. I'm not talking, you know, a $10 sale. I'm talking something that has some value and it's more than one conversation and typically has a sales cycle measured in weeks or months. That's my world. So that, that's to put a fence around that. So salespeople still need to have relationship building capabilities, and they really need to be able to create the conversation to start with, because you can't sell anything if you're not talking to your, your prospective buyer. And, and that is what is the biggest hurdle that salespeople face today. The number one challenge they have is simply getting what I'll call more at bats to use that baseball metaphor, right? Getting the opportunity to have a conversation with a prospective buyer. So I'd like to unpack that for you a little bit because there's a, there's a reason for that, right? Gartner talks about how the, the current B2B buyer has sort of transformed themselves, right? First of all, they're super busy. They've got a lot of projects that they're involved in. The, the number of people that are involved in a, in a B2B buying decision continues to, to grow in number. So whether you believe that number is six or seven or nine, depending on you know, what research you, you read. And then Gartner also says that the, the B2B buyer is only spending 17% of their entire journey when they're looking for a solution talking to p- potential suppliers, 17%. Mm-hmm. So if you then assume... And you can say what you want about assumptions that the, the, the buyer is talking to three suppliers, right? Now you're taking that 17% and dividing it by three. Let's say it's two suppliers. So now you're dividing it by two, but that's still not a lot of time. So the buyer's challenge in two ways. One is they have a limited opportunity because in that journey, that buyer has created a lot of impressions about solutions and they've educated themselves a lot through this thing called the internet, Right. So the, the seller has to be valuable in minute one of the first conversation. But let me complicate it a little bit more for you. And by complicated, what I'm what I'm really getting at is let me explain what's even more challenging for the buyer. Again, I said, I'm sorry, the seller, the, the seller's number one challenge is having more conversations. So one of the ways that this, the buyer is even going to be willing to have that conversation is when they check out that buyer. I'm sorry, I keep mixing them up. When the buyer checks out the seller, meaning they look at that seller's footprint, digital footprint, usually on LinkedIn, and they don't see someone that has, that communicates clearly that they, that that seller understands the buyer's problem, has some history of solving that problem and demonstrates it through content that can be PDFs, case studies, videos, a number of things that can be content that can communicate if that seller isn't attractive to the buyer. I use the word attractive intentionally. It's, it's, it's a metaphor, right? Because in most cases, when you think of attractive, you think of someone that is attractive looking. That's not what I mean here, but you know, it's a play on words. If the, if the seller is attractive to the buyer because of their profile and the credentials that that seller has, then that attraction from the buyer to the seller can generate that sales conversation. So just to get to that conversation is, is a big challenge. And what too many sellers don't realize is exactly what I've just explained is that they need to be attractive to the buyer and to be attractive digitally, they need to have 
the credibility that is explained through customer messaging through their digital footprint. And in B2B, it starts, doesn't end, but it starts with LinkedIn. I'll stop there and give you a chance to uh, chime in and, and feel free to push back and disagree or high five me or whatever you want to do. No, I mean, I agree. And I mean, you immediately went to LinkedIn at the end and that was kind of good segue because it was the next thing I really wanted to talk to you about. You know, obviously I've followed you for a long time now. I've watched, you know, you went, were sort of broad with marketing 2.0 and you've, what looks to me, uh, it looks like you funneled yourself and sort of gone all in on LinkedIn. If I look at the the stuff that you put out, like I can't get into LinkedIn without Vengresso, you know, all over my newsfeed and good content, man. I mean, I've learned some good tricks just from reading some of the stuff that you've posted. I learned about the uh, vo- the uh, voicemail on LinkedIn yeah. that you can use and it, it, I've used it a lot um, because I realized that when people would message me or when I would message them, because I've gotten so robotic in my approach to answering certain things, um, I would go back and leave a, a, a voicemail and say, hey, look, I realized that that answer probably sounded like it was an auto response from a machine. My apologies. Just want to let you know I am a real person and look forward to talking to you. Let me know a time that's good. Listen, man, it works. People buy into that. They um, They connect you on a more human level. So it's a different way to use social media but still create that person to person touch. That's why I like loom. I like zoom in, in the video aspect of everything you do in our industry. We actually do a fair number of number of our proposals via video recorded video. And what we found nice. is that, that the, the buyer actually appreciates that. Now I'm old school, man. I come from the grocery industry where I'm begging people to spend $100 so that I can get a dollar in net profit out of that shopping cart full of groceries. So I believe in pushing them out to the car, loading them, thanking them, and and hoping they come back soon, learning kids' names, all of the things you need to do to be a good technical salesperson. What I have to consciously remind myself is that I need to meet people on the level where they want to receive the information that I have. And when you're dealing with a daycare, for example, and we have several chains of daycares that we represent. You can't go to a daycare during normal business hours and get the decision makers ear to talk to them about a worker's compensation problem. Mm -hmm. You can't go and ask them for 30, 45 minutes or an hour to pitch them on an insurance renewal. What you can do is you can get all of the information when it's convenient for them to get it for you. You can prepare your presentation just like you would if you were going to do it in person and you can sit down. And that's why I have a blue backdrop, you know, behind me, you can sit down and do a screen share of the information with a video of you walking them through the proposal, just like you would do if you were sitting across from them. But the difference is they can watch that at two o'clock in the morning if that's when they want to learn about their insurance renewal. And I, I, that's something that I consciously have to wire myself to to think about is you've got to meet people where they want to be met. Otherwise you're, you're basically chasing them around and and stalking them. But my question, going back to my original question, it looks to me like you're all in on LinkedIn. And I know I've watched this sort of transformation with you over the last few years, probably going back six or seven years ago. I remember when you were just starting to come out with that sort of LinkedIn on demand training program in your find and convert days and you shot it to me and asked me to shoot holes in it. And I'm interested in how you went from that to kind of where you are now. Cause it looks to me like you guys have mastered the LinkedIn game, but not only mastered it, you've replicated, you, you've made it, uh, you've, you've given yourselves the ability to replicate that and teach it to other people that are in sales. And that's one of the main reasons, aside from the fact I owe every ounce of any type of internet marketing success that I have to you in your book, I wanted people to hear your message because I think you're spot on. And and I'll, I'll say one more thing, and then I'm going to turn it over to you and let you just run with it. LinkedIn is one of those platforms where I have seen it. I, I was a very early adopter. I was on LinkedIn when nobody else was on LinkedIn. And a lot of people don't realize it's probably the oldest social network 
that there is, but people weren't getting on LinkedIn in 2005. I was, and I could see what the potential was. I had no idea where it, that it would be where it is today, but I've noticed over time that certain features have gone away and now they've come back. And one of those is event scheduling. Yep. I used to schedule a lot of events in LinkedIn. I was very, very successful in doing uh, meet and greets and, and happy hours and things like that just mixers for clients and they took it away and I couldn't, I, I just thought they hid it from me. I Googled to find out where it went. And then I found out it was completely gone. And I noticed, and I know because you guys are using it, but sometime in the last little bit that has come back on the scene. So I'm interested in, you know, why LinkedIn for you personally, and then just some of the things you've seen with LinkedIn that have morphed over the years and made it a much better platform today than it was 15 years ago. Sure. Okay. So you, you mentioned Find and Convert, my previous company, and so uh, that company was focused primarily on content marketing as an agency. We work with B2B companies and we help them develop their content marketing strategy and help them produce content and help them market that content all for SEO and for lead generation. And so in, in, in the context of doing that, when I was working with marketing departments at companies, at clients... Oftentimes, the conversation turned to sales, like we need to generate leads for sales, and then we want sales using this content because they need this content. And so as those conversations evolved, I uh, connected with several other people in this what I'll call the sales industry, people who were sales influencers. And one of them uh, is Mario Martinez Jr., who is the CEO of Ingresso. And he reached out to me one day and said, hey, I have an idea I want to run by you. And he had been on his own for not quite a year after uh, roughly 18 years in corporate, last role being head of sales at a large um, brand where he had 100 salespeople reporting to him. And he realized that what he was doing on his own, he saw a bigger opportunity to have a company that did that as a service, as a company, not, and not as a sole proprietor. And essentially, his vision was not just around the business opportunity, because that's kind of selfish. The, his vision was, here's how I want to help the sales industry. And here's where I think it's broken from the standpoint of what, what's being taught to salespeople. And we boiled it down to a fishing analogy. So I think you'll appreciate this, David and Kyle. So if you want to teach someone to fish... You don't go right to like, okay, let's learn how to fish, right? You first have to identify, well, what's the bait you're going to use? And then what kind of pole are you going to use to catch the fish you want to catch? Then you have to learn the techniques to go catch that fish once you know what bait and what pole you're going to use, okay? This is a metaphor, right? In the context of using digital selling techniques, we we map that to the bait is analogous to content. Salespeople need content. Remember earlier I talked about being attractive? That buyer is checking you out. And by the way, that buyer is also just doing research online. So if you have content that you can get into their stream by being active on LinkedIn, as you said earlier, David, when you go on LinkedIn, you know, you see me and my colleagues of Ingresso through the content that we're sharing on LinkedIn. So when the seller has content that is Relevant content to the buyer, it clearly speaks to the buyer's pain points. That's an important point. Too many salespeople either aren't aware of that or they don't take the time to go find it or the company they work for isn't doing a good job of supplying that content for them. You know what? I'm going to stop you for one second because there's two things that I'm going to talk about quickly and then I'm going to let you go on. Content marketing is not rocket science. And Marcus Sheridan, I don't know if you followed Marcus Sheridan or not, but yep. um, Marcus wrote the book, You They Ask, You Answer, yep. right? Yep. All you got to do is listen to what people are talking about. They're going to tell you what your content needs to be. You know, I told um, a guy in my organization three or four weeks ago, I laid out a five blog post strategy on what he could do to get out in front of everybody else and their brother on the coronavirus. I was dead on the money, man, dead on the money. And here we are three, four weeks later, everybody's posting everything coronavirus. He could have been perceived as the thought leader. He didn't buy into it. He was one and done. Everybody wanted to know about it. We knew that we could see what Google was telling us that people, you know, were, 
looking for. But, you know, anytime we go into a sales meeting, write down the questions people have. Those are likely to be the same questions that other people have. I mean, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, so I need to keep it simple. I just listen and then I answer the questions. And if they have the question, if I can replicate that somewhere, we're golden. The second comment is my friend, Ryan Hanley. I heard him talk one time. I don't even remember where it was, He, but he was doing a keynote somewhere. And he made the comment that a blog post, and I would argue not just a blog post. At this point, it could be a blog post, a YouTube video, whatever. But a blog post is like hiring a salesperson that works for you 24 hours a day. And I think that's a really cool way to think about it because I can invest an hour to two hours to come up with a really good blog post and make that the best salesperson I can make on that topic to passively work for me 24 hours a day. Yeah, totally, totally agree. Totally agree. But I do want to make a distinction, though, David, the difference between content marketing and content for what we call content for sales. Content marketing is generally content that is published by the marketing department of a company. And it is generally intended to be one to many, meaning it's a blog post, as you as you pointed out, and that's available to anybody that wants to read that blog post. It's one to many content for sales can take that same blog post, but then can one-on-one send it to someone because that person that you're sending it to, you have a very good understanding that this topic and this blog post is going to be relevant to them and you personalize that message. Hey, David, I'm sharing this blog post with you because of X, Y, and Z, because of what I know about you or what conversations that we have had. Now that's content for sales. It's a subtle distinction, but it's a big one because Salespeople who are not leveraging the power of content to engage with their prospective buyers are really missing out, right? So that takes me back to the the second uh, – I mentioned there's three pillars, right? There's There's content, right, which is like the bait in the analogy. And then the poll analogy is that's your profile, the LinkedIn profile. And that LinkedIn profile needs to be written through the lens of the customer, it should have every starting from the banner at the top that should have some visual that shows your branding. If you work for a company, you know, your company's brand should be on there. If you're self-employed, then you should still have some messaging on there, some kind of brand that speaks to your brand. Your your photo, people overlook their photo and they put a 10-year-old photo that doesn't even look like them anymore, right? Should be a headshot, shoulders up or chest up, not something very far away. And as silly as it sounds, you should be smiling. Don't don't hide your teeth. Smile. And then your headline. Too many people, too many salespeople have a headline that's their title. Your buyer doesn't care about your title. Your buyer cares about how you can solve their problems. You have to define what problem you solve, who you solve it for, and maybe what industry. And, and if you can squeeze in the name of your company in there, fine. That's great. Or maybe you can squeeze in uh, a short version of your title, but put it at the end. Then the about section. Your about section is where you tell your story. Too many salespeople either don't have an about section or they have a literally a copy and paste boilerplate that they just grab from their company's website and literally pasted it in there and it says nothing about them. So my point is that the buyer is going to go to a LinkedIn profile to look at that individual and assess whether or not that person is quote unquote attractive to them, as I said earlier. Let me give you a data point to support that. According to LinkedIn state of sales report, 62% of decision makers will look at a salesperson's LinkedIn profile to decide whether or not they will speak to that person. 62% of decision makers do that. It's a huge number. It is a big number. And by the way, that's a two-year-old number, 2018. So has that number gone up or down? I don't know because LinkedIn hasn't updated that, but I would guess that number has gone up. Because the buyer is is more digital than ever before. Okay. I can tell you that's a fact based on the number of people who look at my profile that are a direct correlation to people that I'm talking to or trying to talk to. Exactly. Exactly. So, so I've talked about content and your profile and then there's um, what I'll call training and that's really skills development. 
And as you know, David, at Vingresso, we have a whole program. We have just recently won for the second year in a row this, the, the Gold Stevie Award for a program for the best sales training product of the year. So we're very excited about that. But the training is something that really teaches salespeople techniques that are way beyond just connecting. We teach people how to first find the people you need to uh, find, right? So there's there's literally there's strategies and techniques to find them. Then we teach them how to engage with them before connecting, before connecting. Did I mention that that it's before connecting? Because <laughs> Listen, most people I'm a, go right to connecting. Now, I'm 100% with you. And it's not even that they just go there. They go there and it's this the canned LinkedIn. Yep. I'd like to I'd like to connect with you on LinkedIn or I'd like to add you to my network or whatever. Never. There's there look, I'm a sales guy. I have compassion for other sales guys. There are two things on LinkedIn that are going to get you booted real quick. A generic connection request that shows me no value and why I should connect to you because I do have to think of this as a business owner as well because I I get pitched by a lot of people for things. And the second one is if you send me an automated bot message within the first 24 hours even that you and I have connected, you're out. And I'm going to let you know exactly why you're out because I want you to not do that to other people or you're not going to you're not going to do well in your in your industry. Yeah. I actually have scripted a response to people that I do accept that connected with me without a personalized message because I'll look at them and if I if I see that they're relevant to me in some way, I'll accept the invitation. And then I have a little script. I don't I don't know word for word, but essentially what it says is, hey, thanks for connecting. You know, I'm going to count on you to engage with my content uh, pitch free. Right. I say pitch free. Right. And and again, I'm paraphrasing it, but that seems to have cut it, cut it, cut it down quite a bit on on the, the responses from that. But anyway, so the point is that there's that that three level approach, the trifecta, if you will, of having content that displays your your understanding of your buyer's problems and your credibility, having a profile that really, really speaks to the customer through with customer messaging that, again, makes you attractive to that to that buyer. And then knowing how to find, how to engage, how to connect, and then how to take those connections offline into conversations. And those are things, those are techniques that are only learned and they're not learned in a, in a one hour webinar. They're not learned in a, a one day workshop. We actually teach them uh, across the span of a nine module on demand course that is available to anyone in the world. And for corporations that have big sales teams, we actually do it in a 15 week program because we're doing more. We're doing live as well. We're doing some coaching. It's all virtual, but we're doing live instruction in addition to the on demand. But it, it, it's, it's backed up by neuroscience. The neuroscience says that we as humans, I'm not even talking salespeople now, we as humans retain more when we're consuming things in what's called chunking. Chunking is small chunks of information that's spaced out over time. That is why when we went to college, a semester was how long? Tell me, how long was a semester? It like was, four months. Yeah. It wasn't a week or two days. Like, you know, some salespeople, some companies take their salespeople and put them through a two-day class of some sort, right? And there's research out there. I think this research is from Gartner that – 87% of what salespeople are taught in an in-person training event, 87% is lost within 30 days. 87% is lost within 30 days. And that's just because we don't learn that way. So there's neuroscience that backs it up. And so that's the, the program that we deliver is it's this, this chunked, spaced out content that teaches these techniques on how salespeople can find, engage, connect and then convert those connections into conversations. Awesome. That's good stuff. I mean, you gave us the three pillars there. If somebody's just getting started, um, you know, with, with social marketing, what would be your one piece of advice for them? Well, first I would actually uh, not really think of it as social marketing. I would think of it as modern selling. And modern selling simply means that it's in it's 
engaging the buyer the way the buyer wants to engage. So you have to start with that mindset is just understanding that the buyer needs, the modern buyer needs a modern seller. So I wouldn't think of it as social marketing. Just that out of the gate is just the wrong lens. It's the wrong way to just think about it. Got to be thinking in terms of that buyer is modern. I need to be a modern seller to meet the needs of that modern buyer. That's point number one. Point number two is really the things that I've been discussing here today. You've got to have a strong personal brand with a strong LinkedIn profile that is, that's written with customer messaging. And then you have to know how to find and engage with relevance and value and then connect and then play the long game. Just play the long game. You've got to be doing it consistently. You've got to have what we call a cadence. You have to know what you work, what you're going to do every day and every week on an ongoing basis. This is not a random acts of, you know, selling thing. This is, you know, this is what I'm doing Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, and maybe even a little Saturday and Sunday as well. Absolutely. What's the one thing that somebody could do to improve their, their LinkedIn profile, their, their position? I mean, if, if you've talked about the, you know, the banner and, and what you want to include, like in your bio and not just copy and pasting, but, um, you know, if there's if there's one thing that you would attribute to, um, in, you know, improving it the most, what would you say? So, Kyle, if you don't mind, I'm going to answer your question with two answers. Um, one is, <clears throat> first, we published a ton, a ton of blog content or content mm-hmm. on our blog on that at vengresso.com. So the long Perfect. answer is, like, go to vengresso.com, go to the blog. And go there with a cup of coffee or whatever and be prepared to really get an education because we've got a ton of free content there. But to specifically here and now, what can someone do? Look at your LinkedIn profile and and even have someone else look at your LinkedIn profile and answer the following question. Is it written as a resume or is it written as a valuable resource to the buyer? If the answer is it was that, that it's, it's a resume, it reads like a resume then you're not helping yourself and you're not helping your buyer. And what you're doing is you're hindering yourself. Remember what I said earlier, that data point from LinkedIn, 62% of decision makers are looking for an informative LinkedIn profile to decide whether or not they're going to talk to that salesperson. So is your LinkedIn profile a resume or is it a resource to the buyer? So if it's not a resource to the buyer, then you really have to essentially make it over. And certainly, you know, if you don't mind my saying, uh, putting in a plug, I mean, we do that. The Vengresso.com, just go there and you can learn about that. But whether you do it yourself or you work with someone like us to do that, you've got to make sure that your LinkedIn profile is a resource to your buyer in order for you to increase your ability to start more conversations with your buyer. I would add to that, it also needs to be complete. I mean, if there's anything that LinkedIn has been consistent about from day one, they give you a measurement of how good your LinkedIn profile is as far as being complete. That doesn't mean that the content's correct, but it gives you a benchmark to see what you need to go back and work better on uh, to to get it to where it's complete. I, I agree wholeheartedly, and I have to believe that there have been plenty of people listening to this podcast that have their LinkedIn profile open up right now. Mm-hmm. And they're looking at it wondering, oh man, you know, I can't cause I'm on the podcast, but I can assure you that there are about 30 seconds after this thing wraps up, I'm going to go back and see, because it has been a little while since I've updated. I mean, my pot, my, my profile is good in terms of being complete, but I, I don't know that I would rate it good on content. And, you know, I don't, I think that if we're not able to admit those things and, and look through the lens of the people who we're really trying to reach and, and make adjustments, then what's, what's the point at all? Mm-hmm. Ven Gresso is doing some awesome things. I want you to tell people, you know, obviously you've got free blog content, obviously you have some services, but you've got a large mix of people that are going to be listening to this. It's going to be heavy in the insurance industry to start, but if I'm a one man shop, or if I'm, and I really want help here, or if I'm a larger organization and I'm looking to have Vingresso engage with my team, how are you going to help me? And what's the best way for me to, to get in touch with you to make that happen? Because I don't want you coming on here and just giving us all of this information with no takeaway for you as well. 
you've been a huge impact on my career. Obviously, I've said it time and time again, and I probably won't quit saying it. One day, Bernie, when you leave the world, I'll probably be eulogizing you uh, and, and you know, thanking you for everything you've ever done for me. But at the end of the day, you know, I think I know your skill set. I know your thought process. And most importantly, I know your heart. And your heart has always been in the same place. You've always wanted to be the person that shows people how to fish. You're not the fisherman. You're going to teach them how to do it. So tell these people, man, how to get into the uh, Bernie Borges Bass Pro Shops uh, fishing school. I, I I want to hear how they can engage on whatever level they're in. Well, thank you, David. I appreciate all your, your kind words. Uh, first of all, it's not, not me. It's not Bernie Borges. We, we are a company that has um, a lot of really valuable services for the sales industry, regardless of whether you're an individual or you're a company. So first, company name is Vengresso, V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O, one, one S, one S, Vengresso.com. So we do serve the individual through on-demand training. There's a there's an on-demand course that's available, Selling with LinkedIn. Uh, we actually, depending on exactly when this publishes and depending on some circumstances surrounding the coronavirus, the following offer may or may not be available. We just reduced our price from, for our program from $497 to $97, and we, we're doing it to serve the sales industry because – Everybody is at home now, and a lot of people are struggling with everything we discussed here today. So we're doing that really not to monetize it, but to help think about all, all the revenue we're giving up, right? We're doing it to help the sales industry for the individual. And, and incidentally, we have a lot of people in the insurance industry that uh, have worked with us, both as, at the individual and at the company level. So I'll mention the company programs. We have a Selling with LinkedIn for Teams program and Selling with Sales Navigator program. It typically starts at 15 people and and up. We've done upwards of hundreds of of people and those people go through a 15-week program, again, chunked out in small doses, not 15 weeks uh, of, you know, lots of time. Um, That program has won the Gold Stevie for the last two years, 2019 and 2020. So again, that's a corporate program that's, you know, you go read about it at vingresso.com and then fill out the form to get in contact with someone and you know, we'll have a conversation with you, explain it, learn b- w- about what their your needs are and so forth. And again, we've worked with companies like Woodruff Sawyer and Epic Insurance and Fred C. Church and many, many other well-known uh, insurance companies that have put their people through our program. So those are the two. The individual that's available there and you can go to vengresso.com to learn about both of them and just go under solutions and you'll find them. So here's the thing. We've gotten this far, and I'm absolutely blown away at my own lack of attention to detail. What does Vingresso mean? I'm always interested in the message behind a brand, and I really need you to clear that up for me before we sign off of this, because otherwise it's just going to drive me nuts. And don't tell me to go to Vingresso.com to find out. I want to hear it from the horse's mouth. Sure. It's actually, that's a great question, David. It's actually, it's a mashup of two words in Spanish, uh, venda, and and, and uh, I'm drawing a blank on the other one, but the two of them refer to- um, Ingresso. I'm sorry? Ingresso, is it an ingresso? No, no, no? It's, it's close though. And I'm, I'm drawing a blank on it. I shouldn't, but I, I you know, I'm only going to be honest about it. But it is a mashup of two words that we just mashed up together, brought them together, and of course, the dot com was available, so that contributed a lot to uh, to the the name selection as well. So, what does it mean? Um, it means selling more efficiently. Oh, nice! So, you took a page out of my playbook. That's exactly what I did at the last firm I was with. We had two different words. We couldn't find one word that was Greek or Latin that sounded the way we wanted to. So, we took a mashup and we. We made uh, a, a fictitious word out of two that said basically what we wanted to, and then the whole elevator pitch revolved around that. So that's a that's a cool story. Nice. Bernie, I appreciate you being on. Is there anything else you want to add before we let you go today that you think the world needs to hear about Bernie Borges? And I know that your daughter has been wildly successful. If you want to brag on her for a minute, um, you know I know I've seen her career progress. You were so pumped up when she got her first job in uh, broadcasting and I'm interested in maybe just giving me a little feedback on that quick. Cause I haven't 
well, haven't caught up as, as, as well. a dad you can appreciate this you have four kids i have two um sure i can brag about my daughter because she's public facing she's a sports journalist um so it's easy to do that but then i'm cheating my son who is a long haired and i do mean long hair like you know below the shoulder software engineer for a defense contractor so he's not public facing you're not he's not even on social media but you know when you've got two kids that are just out there gamefully employed you know and um just good people you know that there's nothing more that a parent really can ask for so i consider myself and my my wife and i very blessed in that regard I can tell you that kids are a product of the environment that they're raised in, Bernie, and they were destined from success the minute that you had them. So thank you again for being on the show today. We appreciate it, and I hope that everybody will take some time after you're done digesting all of this free information about your LinkedIn profile and trying to get it from the trash into the uh, into the realm of possibility when it comes to social selling or modern selling, shall I say. And reach out to Vingresso and thank the, uh, thanks again, Bernie. This has been great chatting with you and look forward to continuing to follow you online. My honor, David. Thank you. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com.